you could all take your seats, we'll be starting momentarily. Thanks. Good afternoon, and thank you all for attending this particular public testimony part of the Commission's proceeding. Uh, the way we would like to do this, because we do uh, have a lot of people who want to testify and a fairly tight time schedule, is that we will be uh, rigorously enforcing the time limits, uh, three minutes per person. At one minute, you will see a yellow light right down here start to flash. Co-Chairman Bauer is in charge of the clock. Uh, and if I could, I'll read the order in which you all will be testifying so that we can keep a fairly steady flow up. Janine English, Doug Hill, Paul O'Hanlon, Will Gonzalez, Stephanie Singer, Marion Schneider, Charlie Sullivan, Joe Ferraro, Ben Hovland, Susan Carty, Steve Richardson, Elizabeth Randall, Clyde Terry, Gerald Parisi, if I'm pronouncing that right, Anthony Williams, Gene Bullock, Brandy Martindale, Alexander Gillette, Carla Olmo, Stephen Johnson, Jonathan Brader, Donna Sauberger, uh, KQ, Kyle Williamson, Numa St. Louis, Nelson Diaz, Kevin Solbley, Whitney May, and Seth Flaxman. If I have forgotten any of you who wish to testify, please see Mark down at the end and he can add you to the list. Uh, with that, Janine English, AARP, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Janine English, uh, AARP president-elect. And on behalf of AARP, we appreciate the opportunity to share our views regarding the important work of this commission in addressing ways to improve the administration of elections and promoting the democratic ideal of maximizing effective voter participation for all eligible voters. AARP, AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with over 37 million members that helps people 50 plus have an independent life and make independent choice and control in their lives that will be beneficial to them, affordable to them, and to society as a whole. Congress passed the Help America Vote Act in 2002, requiring states to meet uniform standards in federal election technology and administration. AARP believes the act has been successful in promoting innovation and creative solutions to address the requirements for accessible voting and increasing voter participation. There are examples of successful vote-by-mail elections in Oregon, Washington, and Montana and early in-person voting in 32 states and the District of Columbia. We must build on these successes rather than adopting new rules that discourage voting. A recent GAO survey found that states have also made progress in increasing the accessibility of polling places, but need, more needs to be done. We should restore periodic accessibility reports under the elderly, and Handicapped Act, especially since many states have reduced polling sites and are mandating centralized voting, as we've heard this morning. In addition, AARP believes attention is needed to assure that some 1.4 million residents of nursing facilities can exercise their right to vote. AARP supports additional experimentation 
with mobile polling and designating long-term care facilities as polling places. Further, we need to eliminate voting barriers resulting from imposing overly, overly strict requirements on voters who move into or within jurisdictions, imposing new burdensome ID and verification requirements for registration by mail, more frequent voter roll purges that increase the likelihood of purging errors, excessive and restrictive third-party registration prohibitions that limit civic-minded groups and individuals from assisting eligible people with the registration process, and provisional ballot systems that make it unlikely that ballots cast will be counted. We also find that there are many requirements that hurt older voters who no longer drive and do not need driver's license no longer travel and never needed a passport or do not continue to need a passport. And even if they can receive new birth certificates when they lose their birth certificates, we find that that cost can be an additional $200 or more. I see that I'm out of time. We have uh, submitted our written testimony, and I thank you for the work that you, you do, and AARP will be there to work with the states and the other jurisdictions to make sure that everyone that's eligible to vote can, in fact, vote. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Doug Hill. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to present our comments today. I'm Doug Hill, Executive Director of the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan association that represents all of Pennsylvania's 67 counties, and as is the case in most states, our counties are the ones responsible for voter registration and for conduct of the elections. Um, I want to, I have submitted uh, written comments for you. I'm obviously not going to take time to read through that. Instead, I want to focus uh, just on a few things that have been discussed today. I will echo uh, Pennsylvania's experience with lines is really episodic. It's confined to individual polling places and individual specific circumstances, and that often relates to uh, voter registration issues, poll book issues. It can sometimes be a uh, failure of technology and some of those kinds of things, but it really is very much episodic. Uh, Pennsylvania is helped by the fact that we spread our 8.7 million registered voters across 9,400 polling places, and so the, the voter count at each place is relatively small. We also do not have initiative and referendum, so our ballots are a little bit more compact than what you see in other states, although on the other side of it, we make up for it in number of elected officials. We have 2,700 municipalities, and, and you get the idea. Uh, we've been working steadfastly on improvements uh, that many of the type that you've talked about already. Uh, getting training and keeping poll workers is, is by far and always our, our biggest hurdle. But we're also doing a lot of work to upgrade technologies, uh, share databases, uh, to uh, develop better means to have communication with the polling places uh, so that we can address problems quickly and, and keep voter lines moving. We've also done a good bit in voter training, and apropos of the uh, last panel you had, uh, Pennsylvania has a remarkably robust website, votespa.com. It's maintained by the state, but advertised heavily by the state and our counties during each, of, each part of the election cycle, and then voters can find virtually everything they need there clear down to videos on how to use the equipment that their particular county deploys. We do have impediments uh, to uh, further reform, constitutional, for example, we can't do no excuse absentees. We have statutory issues that limit our deployment of equipment from polling place to polling place. Pennsylvania is a hugely parochial state and 9,400 polling places is very it becomes very difficult to talk about things like voting centers, and of course the voting centers and early voting uh, have uh, fiscal and practical limitations, not the least of which is a court system that always likes to wait till the absolute last minute to finally certify the names on the ballot. Uh, a few suggestions that I want to throw your way on things that we've not heard you talk about yet. We, you did talk about tools for management of resources and lines. Another tool we could use is means to compare equipment and practices um, beyond just certification. Certification certainly tells us whether equipment is appropriate, but it isn't the kind of peer review that lets us know, does this work better, is this other type better accepted by the voters? Uh, another issue we hear regularly from our counties is time to implement. Uh, anytime there's a legislative change uh, or a, a regulatory change, 
quite often it comes far too close to the time for uh, conduct of the election and it makes it remarkably difficult for us to put systems in place and then in turn to train the poll workers and the voters. So I do and appreciate I'm sorry, the, would you mind summarizing? And that's Thank what you. I was just about to do. I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions and we look forward to your report and to furnishing additional information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul O'Hanlon. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Paul O'Hanlon. Uh, I'm an attorney and voting rights specialist with the uh, Disability Rights Network of Pennsylvania. We're the, uh, our state's protection and advocacy organization. And um, like a speaker in the panel before, one of the things I want to emphasize is when we're making election policy for all, we need to consider people at the extremes and that particularly uh, in, in every jurisdiction we have people with disabilities, some of whom are in what I would describe as difficult circumstances. And so um, when you're talking about voter ID laws, when you're talking about long lines, when you're talking about election day challenges, uh, people with disabilities in difficult circumstances I think have to be on our mind. Um, I'm concerned, for example, around election day challenges, most um, uh, precincts aren't equipped to deal with voters who are deaf, who require sign language interpre interpreters. Uh, we have voters who have difficulty with uh, expressing or receiving information. Uh, there are things that we need to really look at. Um, otherwise, people with disabilities are left defending their rights in a circumstance where there's just inadequate procedural safeguards, and that's just not right. Um, the, uh, the process of voter registration is critical in the voting process. Most states, if you're not registered to vote, your vote won't be counted on election day. And therefore, we really need to start with voter registration and emphasizing that. Um, the United States, unfortunately, pay, is in the low category of doing much to assist people to register to vote. Essentially, it's your burden to register to vote. And as you can imagine, people with disabilities have a harder time people in facilities, people in nursing homes. It's not like you're just going to go to your local library and register to vote. Sometimes it requires people to be provided with assistance. Uh, the National Voter Registration Act, one would think, which requires all state-funded disability service organizations to offer regular registration opportunities, would solve that. But if you read the biennial report to Congress, as I do, um, all the states, uh, unfortunately, are bordering between pathetic and what I would say is criminally negligent when you look at disability agency registrations. My state, Pennsylvania, I've been tracking for the last six years. We have never had a year with more than 1,000 registrations by disability agencies, even though the law says with each interaction, each application for service, change of address, recertification of eligibility to be offered, and yet we don't see anything that really suggests that's being done. Uh, I've been saying that if this was done, we would see more registrations. In last year's report, I just want to point out that we have a county, Mercer County, uh, 100,000 people. They registered 65 people with disabilities. Not exactly earth shattering, but if the rest of Pennsylvania registered at that rate, we would have over 7,000 registrations. Instead, we have 800. Uh, so this is a big problem. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. O'Hanlon. Will Gonzalez, if he's here, perhaps not. Uh, Stephanie Singer, Commissioner. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Singer. I'm here to represent the 1.1 million registered voters in Philadelphia who elected me to represent them on our three-person board of elections here in Philadelphia, known as the city commissioners. So on behalf of my fellow city commissioners and my fellow elected officials in Philadelphia and on behalf of the people of Philadelphia, I'd like to welcome the Presidential Commission on Election Administration to the birthplace of American democracy. 
Um, I also represent the Committee on Election Reform of the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania. You already heard from Doug Hill. We are a statewide group of about a dozen elected officials and election administrators working together to improve election policy in the Commonwealth, and I have the honor of being the Democratic co-chair of that committee. So, uh, and I'm an active member of the National Election Verification Network, which is where I first heard about Tammy Patrick's terrific work in Maricopa County, and I think that our president did a great job of selecting people for this panel. Um, so as we heard on the panels today, election administration is an essentially local business. Uh, and the states make the laws within the states, the individual counties create the procedures, and at the polling places, the poll workers uh, carry out the procedures. So, uh, and our election administration is only as good as the people who carry it out. So first of all, it's really great to see such a strong presence of election officials on the panel, on the, on the commission, and also on the panels that have addressed you. And as you craft recommendations, please keep in mind that for any kind of election reform to succeed long term, election officials have to be part of the process at the table from beginning to end. And so my first recommendation is that you include election officials and not just the election officials who get quoted on TV, not just the best and the brightest who have done the, the most interesting work, but you really need everybody. Uh, states are different. Uh, within a state, regions are different. Uh, ballots are different. Everything is different in different localities, and uh, you'll want to hear from everybody. My second recommendation is to honor the poll workers. Now, one way to honor them would be to pay them fairly for the work that they do. And I recommend that. I, that's not something that you can probably do at the federal level. Uh, but at the federal level, you could do some work to honor poll workers. We could have a poll worker appreciation day. Uh, the president could invite the 50 longest serving poll workers to the White House. Something like that if it's visible and it's fun and it's celebratory. Uh, that would make a difference. So those are my two recommendations. Keep election officials in the loop in all parts of the process and honor the poll workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marion Snyder. Good afternoon, Co-Chairman Ginsburg, Co-Chairman Bauer, and Commission members. My name is Marion Schneider, and I'm an attorney with Advancement Project. I'm Advancement Project's Pennsylvania lawyer, and I live, practice law, and vote in Pennsylvania. Advancement Project is a multiracial, national, nonpartisan civil rights organization. We work on the ground and advocate to remove barriers to voting for voters of color. We've been in Pennsylvania since 2004. In 2012, I was co-counsel in Applewhite against the Commonwealth, the suit to have Pennsylvania's restrictive voter ID law declared unconstitutional. I was also co-counsel in Golden English against Chester County, which is a suit that alleged that Chester County violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act by refusing to, to move an inadequately sized polling place to more spacious quarters on the Lincoln University campus. As a result of that refusal, voters waited six to eight hours to vote, mostly African American voters, and some were denied the right to vote outright. And this is exactly what we talked about earlier today, where inadequate polling place resources results in the denial of the right to vote. We have submitted to the commission written public comments. We describe in detail the problems that afflicted Pennsylvania voters in the 2012 election, and we recommend fixes for those problems. Those problems address topics one, two, four, and seven through 10 of the commission's topics that they are charged with considering. For example, one of the recommendations we make is election day or same day voter registration because that cures numerous ills, including eliminating or reducing provisional ballots altogether and allowing voters to vote who have not registered in advance of election day. Similarly, we recommend in-person early voting, just as was discussed earlier today by some of the members of the other panels, because they also cure a variety of the problems that Pennsylvania voters experienced in November 2012. So, uh, we just, I 
can't summarize my testimony, so I, I leave it to you for review, but just to say that we have to fix these problems because those of us who have been working on the ground on behalf of voters see these problems recur time and time again. Fixing these problems is going to require bold action on the part of election administrators and the government. But it's essential that we fix these problems because when we exclude classes of voters from voting, then we don't have a true democracy because not everybody gets to participate. Thank you for giving me the time to speak today. Thank you, and we appreciate your written testimony. Micaia Moore. Good afternoon. My name is Makia Moore, and I'm from Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, Delaware County. I wish I had a nice title like the other people who came up here, but I'm just a voter. And I wanted to give you an idea of what happened to me on Election Day, November 6, 2012. I proceeded to my local polling place to cast my vote for the next president. When I arrived, I was asked to show my driver's license, which I did. After it was verified, I was asked to sign in on the ledger. I did so. Unfortunately, the polling workers decided that my current signature did not match the signature that they have on file. I was instructed to cast a provisional ballot. This wasn't satisfactory to me because I didn't feel as though that would be counted during that election. After insisting on knowing what my alternative was, I was instructed to appear in front of a judge at the media courthouse to prove my identity. On my way to the courthouse, I called to see if I needed any additional documentation like a birth certificate or something to that nature. During the call, I was informed that it was not necessary for me to come. All I needed to do was have a registered voter sign an affidavit stating that I am indeed who I am, and I did. I had one of my neighbors come and sign the affidavit stating that I am who I am. The judge of the election questioned how I received this knowledge and called the media courthouse to verify that I spoke to one of their employees, but still was not allowed to vote at the voting machine. Through a friend, I was given a number to the Committee of 70 who sent two lawyers to fight on my behalf. After discussion with the judge of election, I was told that I was uh, violent in my right, and, but in the end, the judge of election has the final say, so I should cast the provisional ballot rather than voting in the machine that day. Again, that wasn't satisfactory to me. At this point, I took matters into my own hands and contacted Channel 6 News and asked if they would be interested in my situation. They sent the camera crew, and that's how I was finally allowed to vote that day. I hope that my story gives you an idea of what's going on at the voting place on election day, and hopefully you'll be able to do something to change it next time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Charlie Sullivan. Mr. Co-Chair, uh, Commission members, uh, my name is Charlie Sullivan and I direct a, uh, a national prison reform organization called CURE, Criminal Justice Reform. But I'd like to talk to you today about uh, absentee voting by voters who are incarcerated in jails. For the last 10 years, uh, I have been working with the Board of Elections and the Department of Corrections in Washington, D.C. to facilitate voting by eligible citizens confined in Washington's two jails. Although the common perception is that people in jail cannot vote, this is not true. Citizens serving misdemeanors and those awaiting trial can vote absentee. I would like to explain the two steps of registering and absentee voting that are done today in DC jails. This, I think, could be a model for the other 3,300 jails in the country. Please understand that I'm not talking about prisons where people serve felony convictions. Only two states, Maine and Vermont, allow their state prisoners the opportunity to vote. So I'm talking about jails. Step one, registering. The mayor and city council of D.C. passed legislation in 2009 that made the D.C. Department of Corrections, quote, a voter registration agency. As all of you probably know, on the Section 7 of the National Voter Registration Act, D.C. and all other cities can designate agencies as voter registration agencies. 
These VRAs must distribute mail voter registration application forms, give assistance to applicants in completing voter registration forms, and accept completed voter registration forms for transmittal to the Elections Board. Thus, all eligible citizens being processed in the D.C. jails today are given an opportunity to register to vote. Step two, absentee voting. If a registered voter expects to be in custody on election day, he or she must request an absentee ballot by filling out a form that the jails will provide. These filled out requested absentee ballot forms will then be picked up by a DC Board of Elections official and hand delivered to the election board for processing. Then, within one week of election day, Board of Elections officials will hand deliver the absentee ballots to those in the jails who requested them. They will also be available to provide assistance if needed. Then a board official will collect the completed absentee ballots and bring them back to the Board of Elections. Let me uh, end by saying that we do have a handout that the, the D.C. Board of Elections, you have that in your pack, uh, your statement, that actually gives out to people eligible to vote. And uh, I think it's very comprehensive, pretty much goes exactly what I said. So again, thank you and appreciate it. Thank you very much. Joe Ferraro. Good afternoon and welcome to Philadelphia. Thanks for coming. It is truly appreciated. My name is Joe Ferrero. I blog is the, under the name Joe the Nerd, uh, various places. Yes, it's kind of a joke. Um, my degree is in mathematics from Temple University right up the road. I majored in math and with a, a focus on cryptography and computer science. My entire career right now is dedicated upon, predicated on the idea that machines break. Um, just this week, uh, the U.S. Marines website was hacked into by, I guess, Saudi uh, nationals or whatever. Earlier this year, uh, it was revealed in May that uh, ATMs were hacked into by evil hackers for, to the tune of $45 million. Now, if you think about all the money and resources that are put into the security of our Defense Department, as well as our financial systems, it's amazing that that ATM heist actually started in December and wasn't revealed until December, or in, in December and revealed in May. So you, you take a look at um, the discussion that we've had on the machines today. A lot of it was about the lock point of the technology. We've fallen into love of technology for the sake of technology. And I love technology. I've been in it since the, the mid to late 70s. I've worked in, in technology. I've probably, programs I've written have probably calculated your paychecks. I work for a place called Vertex that does payroll systems. Um, the lines and the time, the costs are all tech dependent. Uh, what we need to do is actually get rid of the machines. We can go to paper, but we can uh, merge technology into it. If we remove the voting process, the, the, the machines from the voting process, basically you walk in, you get verified. We use technology, whether it's a voter ID card or driver's license or whatever, but we know who you are. Once we hand you a ballot, we send you over to, to privacy kiosks that can be flexible. You can have 100 kiosks in a place, so you can have the 5,000 uh, people in Virginia, the one Virginia precinct they can all vote, and we're not sitting there waiting for a stall uh, at halftime uh, at a basketball game waiting to use the, the voting stall. We can just fill it out, relax. We don't have a two-minute warning for someone to be pulled out of a voting kiosk to say, you're done voting. We can take our time. We can make intelligent votes. Um, I, we can replace this with a small network maybe one or two uh, network machines with a uh, scanning printer that can be hooked up to the uh, optical printer that's hooked up directly to the county. And then this way, if we need a uh, exotic language, 
We can print down a key for the exotic language that was explained earlier. If someone is Hindu, we can get a key for the ballot. They can put in, oh, E27 is what I want. I can pop in E27 on the English ballot, and I'm good to go. I'm over time. Uh, I've written a lot about this on a patch article uh, back in May uh, under the name Joe the Nerd Ferrero on the Norristown patch. And uh, pens do work. Paper still works. And I hope you have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Susan Carty. I did skip a name, my fault. Go ahead. We'll, we'll get Mr. Hovland next. I apologize. Okay. I, I'm Susan Carty, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters for Pennsylvania. And we would be so proud of you. I'll tell them that you're using the color lights. That's how we run our debates. You gotta keep it on time. Um, I've passed out a map to, to you, which is not in my little conversation. It's just for informational purposes. But it's a map that indicates all the counties of Pennsylvania, the ones that have no uh, PennDOT office. There's uh, nine counties, I believe, that have no PennDOT. And then a certain number of counties only have one day access. Other counties have two day access. And when you see the colors on the map, you will see the volume of the state that uh, is having difficulty even uh, getting a photo ID. I'm going to calculate the square miles in the population not, not today, though. That <laughs> so again, I'm Susan Carty, and I'm so ha grateful for you to have us here today. The League is a 93-year-old organization that has worked tirelessly to ensure all voters have equal opportunity and equal access and uh, barrier-free voting. We meet here today in Philadelphia, proudly referred to as the birthplace of the American democracy. Holding this esteemed and profound place in history, we in Pennsylvania urge you to support model best practices for election systems, not only nationally but globally. As you know, the question of government photo ID in order to vote is controversial here in Pennsylvania, with our courts still considering whether the legislative adopted requirements are acceptable according to our Constitution. Whatever one's views on ID requirements, it is abundantly clear from the Pennsylvania experience that such requirements do not make the administration of elections any easier. At least they add confusion and expense to our election system. The League does support moves to secure online voter registration systems and offers more accessible, efficient, and economical registration opportunities to the voters, including portable statewide voter registration. We continue to strongly recommend the extension of election hours and early voting. Money saved could be better used or spent by making all polling places accessible, upgrading and replacing aging voting equipment, and buying electronic poll books. I'm going to skip because we're running out of time here. Um, we support education designed with the intent to expand understanding of the voting process, education that provides clarity and procedures, and education that encourages all voters to actively pursue their fundamental right to vote. We have seen it all. We have seen it all. We, we have hotline numbers in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. We hear everything you've heard today and more. And it's not all solved, and it continues. Clearly, we need improvements in our election system, and we welcome your interest in our views and hope for reform. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Ben Hovland. Sorry, I messed up the order there. Good afternoon, members of the commission. My name is Ben Hovland, and I'm the senior counsel for the Fair Elections Legal Network, a national nonpartisan voting rights organization dedicated to removing barriers to registration and voting for traditionally underrepresented constituencies and improving overall election administration. I believe there is no area of election administration that can make a more significant and immediate impact on the voting experience of Americans than poll workers. This is a topic that individuals outside of the elections world rarely think about. For the commissioners who are here for their expertise in customer service and lines, from outside the elections world, I'd like to paraphrase former Missouri Secretary of State Robin Carnahan, who often helps people understand the complexity of Election Day by asking individuals to imagine that they run a business. 
This is not an ordinary business, but rather one that is open for basically one day every other year. On that day, you have millions of customers who may or may not show up. On top of that, your frontline employees who are supposed to take care of all these customers are basically volunteers who you are asking to work a 14 to 16 hour shift. Essentially, we ask poll workers to perform an amazing task. Furthermore, that task has become more difficult in recent years. The Help America Vote Act introduced many needed reforms to our elections, but in doing so added new forms, new procedures, and new technology to polling places across the country. Since 2008, there have also been numerous changes in election laws at the state level. Many of these changes have led to court challenges and election laws that are continually in flux. These changes, as we've seen here in Pennsylvania and many other states, lead not only to voter confusion, but poll worker confusion. For the past several months, I've been speaking with election officials around the country about the tools they've created to simplify poll worker training or election day reference materials. If a poll worker has a large line of voters standing in front of them, they do not want to flip through a 150-page manual in search of the answer. I've seen numerous examples of checklists, duty cards, cheat sheets, frequently asked questions, and other innovative ideas that help reduce election day stress on poll workers. The Fair Elections Legal Network hopes to submit a finalized report from this project to the Commission in the coming weeks. However, I'm here today to ask the Commission to focus on the importance of simplifying the poll worker experience by promoting the great ideas and innovative materials being created by local election officials, the Commission can help increase communication and information sharing between jurisdictions. While there are numerous election official organizations, my conversations have shown that more can be done to increase the sharing of best practices from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and state to state. Finally, I'd like to thank the Commission for this opportunity to share my observations and look forward to reading your final report and recommendations. If I can provide any additional information or be of help in any way, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you for your service. Thank you, and we'll look forward to your uh, submission. Steve Richardson. Hello, I'm Steve Richardson, and with me is Greg Moon. We're here from Virginia and uh, testifying on behalf of independent voters in Virginia and our national affiliate, independentvoting.org. We're here not to talk about barriers to casting ballots, but rather barri barriers to participation in elections. Every voter should have full access to the democratic process, and unfortunately, our system is not delivering that. We do not want to minimize the importance of sound administration. However, barely half of all those eligible bother to vote, even in a presidential election, and almost 40% of them decline to associate with either of the parties that control elections. The real problem is that voters don't think their vote will count, even if it's counted. Most votes don't matter because the system reflects partisan preferences that constrain voter choice. For example, even in Virginia, where we do not register by party, major parties enjoy advantages built into the process. Primary elections for major party candidates are publicly funded, but anyone voting in the primary must choose one of the two major party ballots. Virginia primary is considered open, but our elected officials have demonstrated that they have no intention of allowing nonpartisans to fully participate. In 2008 and again in 2012, the Republicans, clearly concerned about Ron Paul's challenges to the party favorites for the presidential nomination, announced voters would have to sign a loyalty oath to receive a primary ballot. This unenforceable and unconstitutional oath, a pledge to support the nominee in the general election, was supposed to prevent others from crashing the primary. But in both cases, it was withdrawn within days due to backlash from members of their own party. This year, in which we're electing a new governor, the Republicans opted to nominate their candidate by convention, foregoing a primary election because they were afraid the lieutenant governor, a moderate, might beat the attorney general in an election open to all voters. A truly democratic system would encourage maximum participation, but closed primaries do just the opposite. Therefore, we encourage you to recommend to the president an extension and expansion of your charter to include systemic issues 
that limit participation in the democratic process. We look forward to your final report and hope to see you in another round of hearings that explore these issues in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Randall. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. Get my lights on. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Randall, Common Cause Pennsylvania's Elections Modernization Campaign Manager. Common Cause Pennsylvania is a chapter of Common Cause, a nonpartisan organization with over 400,000 members and supporters throughout the country, citizens working to build free and fair elections and open, honest, and accountable government. In recent presidential election cycles, Common Cause Pennsylvania has assembled teams of poll monitors to watch election proceedings around the state. In the 2012 general election, we had over 250 poll monitors observing the election and helping voters in over 100 precincts in almost every region outside of Philadelphia. Common Cause Pennsylvania partnered with a large statewide uh, coalition of election protection organizations to address problems on election day, including the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law that maintains a database of election day problems experienced by voters nationally via their 866 Our Vote hotline and, the, and or the OurVoteLive.org website. In the 2012 general election, Pennsylvania generated the second largest number of citizen inquiries and complaints after California with over 9,000 calls. Our findings from the 2012 general election were numerous. However, for the purposes of this testimony today, we are focusing on the single largest problem we experienced on election day, poll books that were missing large numbers of legitimately registered voters. Our written testimony includes more detail, but some of the problems we documented were the following. New voters who had registered, which included both first-time voters and voters who were voting for the first time in their district, who were not listed on the poll books. Some voters who had lived and voted in their district for many years were no longer listed on the poll books. Several voters who brought their attention, or I'm sorry, who brought their registration cards to the polls and discovered then that they were not listed in the poll books were not offered provisional ballots required by law. And in some polling locations, language barriers exacerbated confusion regarding poll books, and often those voters were not given provisional ballots. The quick recommendations in the testimony are online voter registration, same-day uh, registration, establishing uniform national standards for purging voter rolls, no excuse absentee ballot voting and early voting, and making sure that poll workers are equipped with better communication so that they can check for polling locations and to confirm registrations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Clyde Terry. Um, could you give me an audio signal with about 20 seconds to go? Sure. Since I can't see your light. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commission members, uh, my name is Clyde Terry, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Council on Disability. The National Council on Disability is uh, a council of 15 members appointed by the President to advise the President and the U.S. Congress and other federal agencies on policies that affect individuals with disabilities, some 56 million strong across the country. Um, we have already submitted a testimony to the staff of your commission electronically, and I will try to summarize since time is short. Um, we have been engaged in a process of reviewing the implementation of Help America Vote Act. Uh, it's sort of after 10 years of its implementation, and in October we'll be releasing our report summarizing our findings of both its uh, success as well as uh, work yet to be done. In essence, some of our findings, however, just in short, are the three important facts. First off, we encourage that your report mirror ours to ensure that the accessibility provisions contained in the Help America Vote are indeed uh, implemented across the country. Our second recommendation will be to assure that voting equipment Excel itself is uh, applied universally, universally to all voters so that individuals with disabilities can have the same rights to vote privately and independently as all other voters. And our third recommendation is that polling officials should be trained both in how to use that equipment, set it up, maintain it, as well as sort of disability etiquette and awareness 
so that individuals with disabilities can feel welcome and involved in a political process. The justification for these recommendations contained in our report are essentially this. Um, GAO reported in the 2008 election that only that 27 percent of the polling places in its survey were accessible according to the provisions of the ADA and HAVA. We have no reason to believe in the four years between 2008 and 2012 that anything remarkably have changed. So many polling places continue to be inaccessible to persons with disabilities. This is further supported by the Federal Election Commission by its own statement indicating that 20,000 polling places from their best guess are, in, are not accessible to persons with disabilities. Rutgers University did a study in the last election where the participation rate for persons with disabilities was 12.5% less than the general population. Those research, researchers concluded that one of the reasons that is that polling places simply were not accessible and implied a perception that persons with disabilities are not welcome to participate in our electoral process. Just so you know, uh, Mr. Terry, we're running out of time. Got it. Thank you right. very much. Thank you very much. In essence, I just want to recall you that when we start talking about people with disabilities, we're not talking about someone down the street, a neighbor, or someone that you don't know. We're talking about all Americans. We're talking about you know, one in five adults between the ages of 18 and 64 and one in two over the age of 65. Whether it's accident, illness, war, or genetics, we all are part of this community. And if you're commissioning it to help to find a way to make the electoral process available to people with disabilities, you're making it available to all. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Jennifer Mathis. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I am Jennifer Mathis, uh, Director of Programs at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, uh, which is a DC-based national nonprofit organization that uh, advances the rights of people with disabilities, specifically people with mental disabilities, uh, promotes equal opportunity um, in all aspects of life, including voting. Um, consistent with the Commission's direction to identify best practices and make recommendations to improve the experiences of voters uh, facing obstacles in casting their ballots, including voters with disabilities, we urge the Commission to make re several recommendations um, uh, concerning the voters with mental disabilities as follows. Uh, first, the Commission should recommend that states examine their voter qualification requirements and take steps to bring those into compliance with federal law. The Voting Rights Act requires that any test for determining whether someone is qualified to vote, including based on competency standards, must be applied to all voters equally. And currently, this requirement is violated in many states in practice as well as by law. Um, for example, many states apply different rules to individuals under guardianship than to others, placing significantly higher burdens on them to demonstrate the capacity to vote. These individuals are often asked a variety of questions uh, that individuals without disabilities are not required to answer in order to vote. In some states, individuals under guardianship are presumed incompetent to vote and barred from voting altogether, regardless of whether they in fact have the capacity to vote. Uh, in many states, as a matter of practice rather than law, uh, service worker, service providers, poll workers, and our election officials have frequently required individuals with disabilities who live in congregate care settings, such as nursing homes and group homes, to take tests or answer questions that are not required of other voters uh, or have simply prevented these individuals from voting or refused to count their ballots. The Commission should identify as having best practices states that either do not impose a voter competence requirement, and there are 11 of those, uh, or states that have a voter competence requirement that is applied to all voters rather than just voters with disabilities uh, or voters under guardianship. Or number three, uh, states that have a voter competence requirement that is tailored to impose no greater burden on individuals with disabilities than on individuals without disabilities. I think Maryland and Nevada um, have adopted a standard that does that. And I, I've gone through those in our, our written testimony. Um, and finally, uh, would recommend that the commission 
uh, or would urge the commission to recommend that poll workers, election officials, and disability service providers be trained concerning uh, three topics, federal and state law requirements concerning voter competence, uh, two uh, types of voter assistance that are and are not permitted under federal law, and three other types of reasonable modifications required by the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act, including, for example, helping residents of nursing homes and other service settings register, get to the polling place, apply for and complete an absentee ballot if the resident chooses to vote by absentee ballot, uh, and explore mobile polling uh, as well. And I will submit the rest of my testimony in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Karen Bohar. so soon. Uh, my name is Karen Bojar, and I am representing the, national, the Philadelphia chapter of the National Organization for Women, Philadelphia Now. The Philadelphia chapter of Now is committed to making voting easier in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. This is especially important if we are to increase participation in non-presidential year elections. If the people who came out in November 2012 had come out in 2010, we'd have a very different Congress, and in Pennsylvania, a different state legislature, with major consequences for redistricting. People may be willing, or at least some people may be willing, to wait in line for hours to vote for the president, but this generally does not carry over to down-ballot races, such as state legislature. Although making voting easier impacts both men and women, in a sense this is a woman's issue, as women are the ones most likely to be juggling work and family, and thus having trouble getting to the polls, especially when their workplace is far from their home, or as increasingly the case, they are also juggling several part-time jobs. Long lines disenfranchise voters who simply can't take off more time from their jobs and have to leave the polls before casting a vote. This is a far greater threat to our democracy than in-person voter fraud, which nonpartisan analyses have generally found to be extremely rare. Charles Stewart, a political science at MIT, found that the impact of lines is more likely Okay, <laughs> to disenfranchise blacks and Hispanics who waited an average of 20.2 minutes compared with 12.7 minutes for whites. The research about early voting is at this point inconclusive, but as more states move in this direction, we should have a better understanding of the impact. Much of the research was conducted in the early days of early voting and probably does not reflect the current political landscape. Um, Burden and Meyer, professors of political science at the University of Wisconsin, found that early voting is most likely to increase turnout when combined with same-day registration. But even if it does not increase turnout, making it easier for citizens to vote and taking the pressure off election day has got to be a good thing in itself. Another byproduct, well, <laughs> can I finish the sentence? Finish of giving voters more flexibility may be that voters will be under less pressure and more likely to spend time on down ballot races frequently ignored by voters. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Gerald Parisi. Not here. Jen Bullock. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Welcome to our nation's first capital and the city of brotherly love. I'm Jennifer Bullock, founder and director of Independent Pennsylvanians. 
which is a statewide activist group committed to strengthening the power and voice of independence. We are the state affiliate of the largest national activist hub for independence, independentvoting.org. Independents make up 13% of the electorate in Pennsylvania and represent 40% of the electorate nationally. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak directly to you about issues of election and voting access that are very important to me and I think very important for the health of our democracy. A colleague of mine a few months ago who is a very committed environmental activist, he came to me with a very impassioned and heartfelt request. He wanted me to vote for a particular candidate in the primary who has a very good record on environmentalism. I like the candidate and consider myself a good environmentalist, but unfortunately I had to decline his request. This is because along with over the one million PA voters who are registered outside of the two major parties, I am barred in Pennsylvania from voting in the primaries which serves as the very important, important first round of elections, as we all know. Pennsylvania is one of 17 states whose primaries are closed. This is fundamentally undemocratic. And to add salt to the wound on our democracy, I am barred from a voting process that I help to pay for as a taxpayer. This and many examples we can share regarding the hyper-partisan control over redistricting, poll management, ballot access, to name a few, is what we ordinary citizens want and need to change. Power to the people, not the parties, is not just a slogan, but an important dialogue that needs to be addressed with seriousness and rigor. This includes a, tru a truly nonpartisan view of our voting process that with all due respect, goes beyond, albeit also very important, issues such as accurate vote ca voter counting and user friendliness of, po of polling and voting mechanisms, and goes to the heart of free and fair elections. On behalf of the over one million independents in Pennsylvania and 40% nationally, I invite the commission to a more to more fully explore what it means that every voter counts as well as making sure every vote is counted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is Anthony Williams here? Uh, Brandy Martindale? Hello, and thank you for um, holding this hearing, and thank you for serving on the commission, and thank you for affording us the opportunity to weigh in on our democratic process. I'm Brandi Martindale. I'm a recent graduate of Columbia University Teachers College from the master's program in organizational social psychology. Um, the President's Commission of Election Administration has come together to address several problematic narratives that plague the American election system. There's the narrative of the disabled who can't reach the polling place, that of the soldier who is overseas during the elections, and that of the understaffed polling place which cannot keep up with the volume of voters. These and many others are being considered by the commission. However, one narrative is being ignored, that of over 13 million Americans, the narrative of closed primary processes. In 19 states, closed primaries lock out over 22% of their electorate through political party control. Nationally, this number accounts for just over 7% of the total electorate. 13,193,753 Americans have no say in who they choose from in the general election because political parties close the primary process. 
primary elections are paid for partly with independent voters' tax dollars, yet these voters are excluded because they do not wish to register into a political party. This mechanism forces voters to join political parties they do not support in an effort to retain their right to vote. Over 40% of Americans now identify as independent. This suggests that in the states with 22% unaffiliated voters, another 20% have registered into political parties just to retain their right to vote in primary elections. This phenomena may cause political leaders to feel a false sense of support on party issues. Because leaders look at registration numbers and assume members join the political party because they support their stance on issues, leaders may not realize they are failing to represent the will of their constituents, but they are. Polls across America suggest our nation's leaders are lagging behind the American public on a number of social issues. To move forward, America needs the Overton window to shift. We need our leaders to catch up, and forcing people to join a political party to retain their right to vote is stifling the message that America wants change. I understand the reasoning behind party primaries. I understand why they were developed and what their intentions were. But a truth remains. A mechanism which denies otherwise qualified voters from casting their ballot is an unacceptable means to an end. I implore the committee to include these numbers and to include this structural barrier into their research. To ignore this narrative is to ignore the injustice forced upon 13,193,753 Americans and is a blatant abdication of democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander uh, Gillet. Good afternoon, members of the commission. I'm Alexander Gillette, chair of the Green Party of Philadelphia. I would like to talk about ballot access as an element of the right to vote. The right to vote doesn't mean anything if voters don't have the opportunity to vote for the candidates they want. That happens because those candidates can't get on the ballot. Thousands of Pennsylvanians have registered as Greens, Libertarians, and Independents. Yet it is very difficult for third party candidates and independents to get on the ballot in Pennsylvania. A third party like the Green Party must submit nominating petitions containing the signatures of currently registered Pennsylvania voters equal to at least 2% of the highest total vote of a statewide candidate in the last election. For 2014, that means that the Green Party would have to collect 62,511 signatures to get a candidate on the ballot versus 2,000 for the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, the signatures on nominating petitions must be identical in all respects to the information on the voter's registration card on file in the voter's county. If someone used a middle initial on the voter registration form but fails to print and sign that middle initial on the nominating petition form, the signature is invalidated. There are all kinds of, there are many more technical requirements to <coughs> to the correctness of the petition. Once the petitions are, are filed, they're subject to being challenged by other, other, vo uh, other Pennsylvanians. Um, in 2004 and 2006, the candidates lost petition challenges uh, on all these variety of technicalities. And in addition to that, they were assessed costs in excess of $75,000 to be paid to the challengers. Assessing a, kind of, a candidate cost for losing a petition signature challenge has a chilling effect on citizens who want to run for public office. Those, it turns out that both of those challenges were organized by the Democratic Legislative Caucus of, the, of this Pennsylvania legislature and by a legislator named Michael Vion, who's currently in prison for the charges of using public employees to, to do private political work, uh, as are a number of his associates. Um, my right and the rights of my fellow Greens, all of us registered voters, to vote for candidates of our choice 
has been taken from us in Pennsylvania because of the ballot access laws, and more importantly, the way those laws have been interpreted and enforced by Pennsylvania courts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Carla Olma. Jerry Batamala. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jerry Vatamala. I'm a staff attorney in the democracy program at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, ALDEF, as it's called, is a 39-year-old national civil rights organization based in New York City that promotes and protects the civil rights of Asian Americans through litigation, legal advocacy, community education, and community organizing. ALDEF has monitored elections through annual multilingual exit poll surveys since 1988. For nearly 25 years, ALDEF has monitored elections for anti-Asian voter disenfranchisement, compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act's language assistance provisions, Section 203, and non-discrimination protections, Section 2, and implementation of the Help America Vote Act, HAVA. In 2012, ALDEF dispatched over 850 attorneys, law students, and community volunteers to 127 poll sites in 14 states to document voter problems on election day. The survey polled 9,096 Asian American voters in 11 Asian languages. I'm not gonna be able to go through all my testimony, obviously I only have three minutes, so I, I plead with the commission to please review my written comments. I've also included our report, a section 203 report on uh, uh, our observations from the presidential primary elections uh, in jurisdictions that were covered under Section 203. Uh, I've also included our observation and complaint letters that we sent in to all of the jurisdictions that we were in on Election Day. That's again, that's 14 states, 127 poll sites. Uh, all of our observation letters are included in my testimony as attachments. Uh, we've also included a letter that we sent to the Department of Justice uh, outlining the major uh, violations of local and federal law that we observed on election day. Uh, right here in Philadelphia, uh, there was inadequate language assistance for Asian Americans, excessive and illegal requests for identification, and violations of HAVA. Briefly, uh, although Philadelphia is not covered under Section 203 for Asian language assistance, the city of Philadelphia agreed to provide interpreters at targeted poll sites for Asian Americans who speak Chinese, Khmer, Korean, and Vietnamese pursuant to the 2006 settlement from U.S. v. Philadelphia. Unfortunately, the city has significantly backslid on its promises from the settlement. The city provided a total of only four Chinese, Khmer, Korean, and Vietnamese interpreters for the entire city on Election Day in 2012, which was wholly inadequate and resulted in Asian American voters being prevented from voting, particularly at the South Philadelphia Branch Library, and that's included at uh, Attachment A uh, to my testimony, our observation letter for uh, that poll site. Uh, Asian Americans uh, we saw were uh, asked for ID uh, in much higher numbers than other voters. Um, five voters in Upper Darby Township uh, and three voters in Philadelphia were required to prove their citizenship uh, before voting. Uh, we had 52 respondents in our survey who said that they were asked for identification. 26 of those 52 uh, we're not first-time voters, and we're not required to show ID. Uh, that's 50% of the voters. Uh, briefly, as I, it's in my testimony, Annandale, Virginia, Asian American voters were segregated into separate lines. In New Orleans, Louisiana, Asian Americans were prevented from being assisted by a person of their choice in violation of Section 208 of the Voting Rights Act. Thanks, uh, but we need you to sum up if you could. Okay, absolutely. Um, Asian American voters are uh, overwhelmingly naturalized citizens, first-time voters, limiting was proficient. Uh, we need local and uh, local jurisdictions to comply with the requirements of Section 203 uh, to re uh, follow Section 208, the Help America Vote Act, uh, and to stop asking uh, and requiring Asian Americans to provide uh, forms of ID that are not required of other uh, voters. 249 voters of, on our survey on Election Day were required to prove their citizenship. That's completely unacceptable, and I hope the commission will uh, review the letter and the attachments and, and take our recommendations into account. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Rong Sorn. Uh, 
Good afternoon, member of commission. Thank you for the opportunity to um, say briefly of who I am and what I do in Philadelphia. My name is Rong Son, and I'm the executive director of the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia, and we represent about 20,000 so Cambodian uh, population in the Greater Philadelphia area. And we sell about 1,000 or so um, a year through direct service, advocacy, and cultural edu education. For the last 13 years, uh, we've been um, very active in conducting community engagement, which include helping a community member to become citizen, um, conduct a voter registration drive, and also um, conduct GOTV, which is um, voter education, voter mobilization, including phone banks, and um, also the postcard and, all, and so forth. Um, we, most of our members who are new to the country, this they may be their first time going out to vote. There are so many confusion, and um, as previous speaker from all that has mentioned, these are the problems that exist in our community. So we wanted to make sure that um, our, any voter, regardless of their ethnicity background or language um, capability, have access to the, to the polling place and can cast a vote. Um, we wanted to make sure that we promote democracy and to keep our voter um, really engaged and participate fully. Um, with these new laws and all the barrier really discourage our voters, especially elderly with limited profession, uh, English proficiency. So we wanna ensure that they have the right and they can cast their vote. And please also look into supporting the local uh, community-based nonprofit or agency that really work tirelessly at the ground level as our agency without compensation, but we see the need to help these community members to really exercise their fundamental right. But we wanted to make sure that they are fully participate, so we work tirelessly to really promote and encourage and educate and really mobilizing them to get out to vote. So please ensure that every voter have access to um, cast their vote and make their vote count, and please support the local nonprofit or local community base that really work at the ground level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stephen Johnson. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Howard Johnson. My testimony today accompanies that of Donna Sauerberger, Steve Richardson, and Greg Moan, and two or three others who have already spoken. I am an independent voter, a citizen of Maryland, and an American citizen. From all these perspectives, I want America's principles of government strengthened. One of our first principles is that we, the people, are the nation's electors. It is for us, the nation's voters, to choose the elected officials we want it is not for elected officials to choose the voters they want. I will expand on this point in my written testimony. Today I want to describe election day and how business was done at my polling place in Maryland. Our state had seven major issues on the ballot. My county, Anne Arundel County, had another 14 or so. Some of these measures were well, well publicized, but most were rather obscure. After an hour of waiting in line, it came my turn to vote. I was asked to stand at a touchscreen computer and scroll through this lengthy set of ballot questions. As you can imagine, like everyone else, I tied up several minutes of computer time figuring it out and casting my vote. I have a bit of an operations background. From that perspective, I see a major design error in how Maryland's voting system was set up. No one in Maryland thought to separate the lengthy process of reading and marking one's ballot from the very brief process of hitting enter. The two processes were jammed together on the same computer and that's why our wait times were so long. The separation we need would not be hard to achieve. Suppose there had been 30 or 40 chairs and shielded clipboards for voters to use while sitting and reading their ballots, paper ballots, and making their choices. And then suppose as each voter finished, the next step had been to hand one's ballot to an election clerk so that it could be fed into a ballot counting machine. Think of that brief step as the equivalent of hitting the enter button on the touch screen. Had my polling place been set up in the efficient way I have just described, every voter's wait time in line would have shrunk to almost nothing. Let's consider making it a national standard 
that the physical process of wading through a ballot will always be separated from the machine process of reading the ballot choices and capturing each vote. Each vote. I too hope to see you at a second round of hearings with an expanded charter. Appreciate your being here today. Thank you very much.